everyone, and welcome. You're watching Eagle News America. I'm Philip Toledo coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. It's Tuesday evening here on this side of the world, May 25, 2021. And tonight, as always, we have updates from several of our correspondents across North America. Thomas Likeness in Edmonton, Alberta. Status of the pandemic in Canada, something like a carnival game. Andre Rio Tutar in Panorama City, California. Los Angeles Airport opens the west gates at the Tom Valley International Terminal. Bureau Chief Angel Membrere in Sacramento reports about California proposing a record high $2 billion for wildfire and emergency preparedness. Then Bureau Chief Carlo Valdez in Union Township reports about Governor Murphy visiting Lockheed Martin facility in Morristown to highlight the addition of 400 new jobs by 2023. Then we'll head to Las Vegas, where Julianne DeSena brings us tonight's entertainment news. Whether you like action, thriller, or an old-time classic, there's a movie out this week for you. Then for EBC Sports, EJ Gonzalez in Alexandria joins us this evening. For tonight's NBA playoffs recap, the Bucks command a series over the Heat and the Nuggets even their series with the Blazers. And for arts and culture, Eagle News correspondent Gemily Marinovic takes us to a glass museum in Corning. Then for tonight's roundtable, how we enjoy that homemade lunch for a national brown baguette day. Our coverage begins. From their new home in Poland, the parents of Belarusian journalist Roman Protasevich have been in anguish since he was seized after his flight was forced to land in Minsk. Natalia Protasevich, the 26-year-old's mother, says she has not slept for two nights and grips her phone tightly, hoping for any news about her son. У меня просто меня переполняют эмоции. Мне просто хочется кричать на весь мир: "Пожалуйста, спасите моего сына! Ну не дайте за то, что..." Ребенок правдиво, парень правдиво освещал ситуацию, правдиво освещал ситуацию. Он не делал ничего дурного. Поэтому я прошу, я просто умоляю, я призываю всю мировую общественность спасите. Да, это всего один журналист, да, это всего один ребенок. Ну, пожалуйста, если есть, если есть, вот понимаете, я как мама прошу, вот материнские чувства, отцовские чувства, родительские чувства, я прошу помочь, я прошу помочь, спасите, спасите его, пожалуйста. The 46-year-old Natalia and her 48-year-old husband, Dimitri, say they think Roman might be in a detention center run by the Secret Service, still known as the KGB. But they do not know for sure, and the uncertainty is torturing them. Сегодня адвокат пытался к нему попасть, но был отказан. Вот. Она не смогла с ним встретиться. То есть мы до конца не знаем, там ли он, в каком он находится состоянии, как он себя чувствует. In other news, Secretary of State Antony Blinken vows to rebuild U.S. relations with Palestinians by reopening a consulate in Jerusalem and giving millions in aid to help the war-ravaged Gaza Strip. The announcement signal a clean break with U.S. policy under former President Donald Trump, who had shuttered the diplomatic mission for Palestinians in 2019 and slashed aid to the Palestinian Authority. Blinken's visit, part of a wider Mideast tour, comes after Friday's truce ended 11 days of heavy Israeli bombing of Gaza and rocket fire out of the enclave on Israel, as tensions simmer in the annexed East Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. Blinken reiterates support for Israel's right to defend itself against rocket attacks by the Islamist group Hamas, where he says, which he says must not benefit from the aid effort. I'm here uh, to underscore the commitment of the United States to rebuilding a relationship with the Palestinian Authority and with the Palestinian people, uh, a relationship built on mutual respect and also a shared conviction that Palestinians and Israelis alike deserve equal measures of freedom, security, opportunity, and dignity. In total, we are in the process of providing uh, more than $360 million in urgent support for the Palestinian uh, people. And across these efforts, uh, we will work uh, with partners to ensure that uh, Hamas does not benefit from uh, these uh, reconstruction efforts. Asking the international community, uh, asking all of us to help uh, rebuild Gaza 
only makes sense if uh, there is confidence that uh, what is rebuilt uh, is not lost again because Hamas mm -hmm. decides to launch uh, more rocket attacks in the future. Back here in the U.S., Philanise Floyd, George Floyd's younger brother, meets with President Joe Biden at the White House and calls for federal laws to protect people of color. This is the thing. If you can make federal laws to protect the bird, which is the bald eagle, you can make federal laws to protect people of color. What about the Melanie's Floyd and other members of the family met privately with the president on the first anniversary of George Floyd's May 25, 2020 fatal sh death by a Minneapolis police officer. In related news, President Joe Biden tweets that America is at an inflection point one year after the killing of George Floyd. President Biden says last month's conviction was a step towards justice, but we cannot stop there. Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes as he passed out and died, is to be sentenced in June for murder and manslaughter. In the wake of Chauvin's conviction last month, President Biden sought to build on political momentum by urging Congress to pass a far-reaching police reform bill in time for the anniversary. However, the ambitious deadline comes with only the House having passed the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, while the Senate continues to wrangle over key details. Despite missing the president's hope for deadline, Representative Karen Bass, a co-author of the reform bill, reiterates her commitment to Democrats and Republicans negotiating a compromise. At the meeting with the Floyd family, Bass says they will get the bill on the President Biden's desk and will work until the job is done. She also says it will be passed in a bipartisan manner. Pelosi, too, expresses optimism, saying the bill supporters and the Floyd family were hoping to pass a bill named after George Floyd. The proposed law seeks to reform what critics say have become ever more violent and unaccountable police forces around the country. Biden says a culture of impunity and underlying racism has made tragedies like Floyd's death increasingly common, although opponents believe police operating in often heavily armed communities are being scapegoated. As if to highlight the staggering number of U.S. shootings, multiple gunshots rang out Tuesday near the site in Minneapolis where people were marking the anniversary of Floyd's killing. Attorney General Merrick Garland recognizes the brave and resourceful public safety and child-serving professionals who are dedicated to protecting children, including the heroes being honored for the 38th National Missing Children's Day. The law enforcement officers tasked with finding missing children operate under extreme pressure and work with the utmost urgency. I have great respect for the brave and resourceful public safety and child-serving professionals who are working every day to protect kids. They deserve our deepest gratitude. I am honored to take part in the 38th National Missing Children's Day virtual commemoration. Garland mentions the more than 365,000 reports of missing children in 2020 and the emotions parents of these children feel. Whether a child has been abducted or just wandered away from home, the terror felt by a parent when their child has disappeared is overwhelming. Garland also warns of the dangers of the internet posing on children, including child pornography. The internet has brought many changes to our society, but not all of them have been benign. Early on, predators began using the internet to groom and abduct children for trafficking, child pornography, and other despicable purposes. Attorney General Garland also highlights department activities to protect children, including the Project Safe Childhood Initiative and the department's support for 61 Internet Crimes Against Children task forces. Those task forces have been finding and arresting online predators and rescuing child victims for more than two decades. We remain fully committed to giving them the resources they need to continue their vital work. Now for today's update on the COVID-19 numbers. According to the Coronavirus Resource Center of Johns Hopkins University in Medicine, as of 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Tuesday, May 25th, the number of cases of COVID-19 reported worldwide is now over 167 million. 
The countries with the three most number of recorded cases are the United States with more than 33.1 million, India with more than 26.9 million, and Brazil with more than 6.1 million. The virus has now claimed more than 3,476,000 lives worldwide, with the three countries with the most number of COVID-related deaths at the U.S. with over 590,000, Brazil with over 449,000, and India with over 307,000. Total vaccine doses administered worldwide are now at 1,706,513,398. In COVID-related news marking another huge milestone in the fight against the pandemic, the White House today says half of all U.S. adults will have received full COVID-19 vaccinations. Today, the United States will hit 50% of adult Americans fully vaccinated. That number was around 1% when the president took office. So that's certainly a significant development. More than half a million Americans have died from the coronavirus, but the country is now a world leader in rolling out vaccinations. The United States has reached almost 50% of its population of 332 million with at least one dose. But its vaccination campaign is now slowing in the face of hesitancy. President Joe Biden has set a target of having 70 percent of adults vaccinated with at least one dose by July 4. The current figure is almost 62 percent. Now, up next, we'll have reports from Edmonton, Alberta and California. Eagle News America continues. We'll be right back. Manda na kayo dahil this is gonna be an exciting battle para sa ating monthly finalist. This is Tagisan ng Galing Part 2 Singing Edition. This program is supported by China Bank. Your success is our business. Factual. We have to defeat the virus everywhere. Timely information. Balanced, not only in the country, but also abroad. I'm certain of one thing. Interviews that people need to know. Watch Aguila Pilipinas. A one-hour newscast of reports coming from regional hubs in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Know the important updates in Asia in ASEAN in Focus. Track the latest stories in the provinces in Aguila, Provincia. Tune into Mata ng Aguila, the evening primetime news program of Net25. Balanced and objective, Mata ng Aguila covers national and international issues, tackles news on business, health, science, and technology, entertainment, sports and human interest features and current events and eagle news international On delivers the latest lines. global reports impartial accessible and up-to-date it brings to four ebc's rich international scope and access to valuable information streams catch these programs on net 25 you can also watch our news programs through eaglenews.ph and Eagle News Facebook page and YouTube channel. Welcome back. You're watching Eagle News America. I'm Philip Toledo coming to you from Atlanta. Let's head over to Canada where the COVID-19 pandemic situation is like a carnival game. In Alberta, Bureau Chief Thomas Likeness tells us which game and why. 
Thomas? Thanks, Philip. Yeah. Did you ever play Whack-A-Mole? You know that carnival game that's also found in arcades? Players use a mallet to hit these tiny moles back into their holes, and then they randomly pop up again. You knock one back in, another one pops up, and the game continues. And this is how the third wave of the pandemic seems to be going in Canada. Now, you recall about six weeks ago, I told you about Ontario, uh, Canada's largest province, imposing a stay-at-home order because of a sharp rise in COVID-19 cases. Similar measures uh, then went into effect in Quebec. Then BC was next, brought in tough measures to cope with an outbreak there. Then it was Alberta's turn as, as cases began to fill up hospitals and critical care units. But on the East Coast, in the Atlantic provinces, things seemed to be under control. But a few weeks ago, outbreaks there began to overwhelm the healthcare system, and restrictions are now the order of the day in Atlantic Canada. So what's the situation look like today? The outbreaks have been tamed in Ontario. Restrictions are being eased. British Columbia today also announcing an easing of the public health measures there. Alberta still mulling things over, although I'm told the Premier will release a reopening plan tomorrow morning. And all of this is being done while doctors are recommending against reopening too fast. Oh, another mole has popped up. This time it's Manitoba. Things are so serious there that Manitoba is sending critically ill patients to neighboring Ontario because there's no room in Manitoba to care for them there. It's, you know, it's just frustrating as we bring things under control in one region, outbreaks are occurring in another. And one has to wonder whether a coordinated national lockdown way back in the beginning, this time last year, might have been more effective instead of leaving it to the provinces which have found themselves catering to the local political whims. You know, the national approach seemed to have worked well in Australia and New Zealand. Unfortunately, it's a bit late to try it here. But hopefully soon, we can pound all of those moles back into their holes. In Edmonton, Canada, Thomas I. Likeness Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Philip. Thanks, Thomas. Now, uh, speaking of moles, you said the latest mole to pop up was in the province of Manitoba. Uh, can you give us a little bit more information on the situation there? Yeah, Philip. First, first of all, a bit of geography. Uh, Manitoba is the province that borders on the state of North Dakota. So it's somewhat in central Canada. Uh, the province uh, says its health care system has been stretched to the limits. It's asked for federal help. And today, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, promised to send medical staff through the Canadian Red Cross and the Canadian Armed Forces uh, into the province to help. And as I said, the province is transferring critically ill patients to Ontario because there's simply no more room in their, in their ICUs. Ontario, though, interestingly, had that same overcrowding problem until a couple of weeks ago, but that mole has been knocked back into that hole. Philip? Thanks for that, Thomas. And, you know, earlier we were talking about the U.S., you know, being at about 50 percent of uh, adults being vaccinated. Uh, what about there? Is, is the vaccination making a difference? Well, in uh, areas where immunization is high, case numbers appear to be dropping. And according to the Prime Minister at his news conference this morning, more than half the total population has received one dose. We're a little bit behind. Uh, I, I wish we were where you guys were at, uh, where half the population had received two doses. But he does say Canada now ranks uh, third among the G20 countries in doses administered per capita. But uh, while we're still making people wait uh, up uh, to four months for that second dose, so uh, I think I've got about two and a half months to go for mine. I was listening to an infectious disease expert this morning who said, you know, it's, it's time to make sure the older demographic, people over 60, get that second shot because he says it's those people who are most likely to end up in hospital if they do contract the infection. And the goal should be to ease the pressure on the health care system, as well as trying to achieve that herd immunity. Uh, the federal government does say, well, hopefully in a couple of weeks, they can start offering second doses. That's assuming deliveries of uh, the vaccine arrive as promised. Philip? Thanks, Thomas. And I understand that U.S.-Canada border closure um, has actually affected the plans of a Montana Indian tribe to vaccinate Canadians. Uh, do you have any more information on that? 
Yeah, Philip, uh, the, the Blackfeet Indian tribe in, in the uh, state of Manitoba has land bordering on Canada, and it has offered and had been doing this, injecting its surplus vaccines into the arms of Canadians. The, the Blackfeet set up vaccination clinics at the border in southwestern Alberta. Now, initially, they were offered to just Indigenous people, but then they opened it up to everyone, and the clinics proved to be popular. Uh, those clinics have now come to an end, though, and uh, that's strange because, you know, there's plenty of vaccines. So what happened? Well, remember the Canada-U.S. border is closed to non-essential traffic. And it seems in the eyes of bureaucrats in both countries, crossing the border to get a vaccine is not essential. Apparently, helping to prevent disease, possibly death, helping Canada to achieve herd immunity so that regular traffic can flow between the two countries. Apparently, none of that is essential. Gotta love the bureaucrats. Philip? You know, yeah, Thomas, I can definitely see where that might uh, lead to some uh, conclusions of some mixed messages there. So I definitely appreciate that. And uh, before we go, I hope that you... Uh, brought your lunch with you because later on in our episode, uh, we are going to have our virtual roundtable talking about National Brown Baggett Day. So, oh, so the only we'll way to, to go. Time. The only way to go is the brown bag. Thanks, Philip, and take care. Thank you. You as well. In California, a terminal at the Los Angeles International Airport just got a billion dollar makeover. In Panorama City, Eagle News correspondent Andre Rayo Tutar is with us tonight. Andre? Thank you, Philip. Los Angeles International Airport, or LAX, opens the west gates at the Tom Bradley International Terminal to travelers of domestic and international flights. It is a $1.73 billion investment that took four and a half years to construct with over 8,500 workers, about 30% of them employed from the surrounding communities of LAX, and provided more than 2,500 jobs to Angelinas. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti was on site at the grand opening. Let's take a look. There's so many folks to thank today. And this is a big day um, in a big city that's building out a big new infrastructure. We have, for the last eight years, been from transit to the port, from the airport um, to our roads, been building a new city. Um, and this airport reflects that. This is one of the crown jewels of that uh, effort a $1.73 billion state-of-the-art facility with a capacity to 12, for 12 to 15 aircraft, a place to bring comfort and convenience and welcoming uh, to folks that are coming back home, to people who are visiting for the first time, and an even higher level of service for both international and domestic travelers using the Tom Bradley Terminal through everything from biometric self-boarding technology to the cool roofing that we can see on top of this. Part of the $14.5 billion modernization project of LAX, the new West Gates features a five-level building that is 1,700 feet in length and consists of 15 gates, adding 750,000 square feet to the Tom Bradley International Terminal. Mayor Eric Garcetti also states, LAX is our gateway to the world, a global crossroads where dreams take flight and where we welcome the future of our city with open arms. Completing the West Gates is the latest step in our unprecedented campaign to reimagine LAX, to help our airport realize its potential as a premier 21st century destination, as a source of jobs and economic growth for local workers, and as a site of seamless travel for millions of passengers. This state-of-the-art complex will give travelers a digital next-generation experience in this 21st century with biometric technology. There will be many locations to plug in and make use of the wireless internet, touchscreen kiosks, three play areas for children, two nursing rooms, animal service relief area, and a baggage handling and boarding system described as the most technological advance of any airport in the nation. Justin Urbachi, the chief executive officer of Los Angeles World Airports, or LAWA, says, this is the first mega project at LAX under the leadership and vision of Mayor Garcetti. Working with our city council and our board to build a world-class airport, one that will redefine our airport experience. We are delivering 
full modernized terminals, new technology and guest services, and improved connections to our regional transportation system, and investing in infrastructure that creates a more resilient airport and an even stronger economic engine for Los Angeles. In Panorama City, California, Andre Rio Tatar, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Back to you, Philip. Thanks, Andre. You reported that it took $1.73 billion to construct this new West Gates. Did any funding of this project come from taxpayers there? Actually, no, Philip. Uh, none of the funding uh, to build the new West Gates came from taxpayer money. The $1.73 billion was generated from the airport's operating re revenues, airline fees, passenger facility charges, airport revenue band proceeds, bond proceeds, and the capital improvement program funds. LAX is currently in a $14.5 billion capital improvement program, which will be allocated to upgrade their nine passenger terminals, construct new facilities, the automated people mover train, a 4,300 stall parking structure, and a combined rent-a-car facility. Known as the second busiest airport in the nation and the third busiest in the world, LAX aims to lead and be in line with new technology in meeting the needs of the next and future generation of travelers. Philip? What's the target year for the completion of this $14.5 billion capital improvement program at LAX? Well, um, this program began in 2009. Uh, and is expected to be all completed in 2023. So Los Angeles is almost there. Also known as a LAX modernization program, it was a massive and ambitious plan of the city when it first began, projected to create over 121,000 construction-related jobs annually. Upon completion, LAX will be transformed to a state-of-the-art international airport of the new century, attracting tourists worldwide. This will be definitely a great sight to see in 2028 when athletes from around the world will, will arrive in Los Angeles for the Summer Olympics. Which part of the LAX modernization program are you looking forward to? I'm actually looking forward to the construction of the consolidated rent-a-car facility. Uh, at this time, the car rental locations at LAX are all spread out in various locations throughout the airport. This future facility will have a 789,000 square feet quick turnaround with 64 maintenance bays, 186 fuel nozzles, and 37 car wash bays. This quick turnaround will also be built to be environmental friendly as there will be a solar farm and will be using recycled water. So it will sound like a dream come true to many LAX travelers. Uh, speaking of uh, LAX travelers, uh, Andre, uh, where's the next trip you're going to take out of LAX? Hopefully, it might be Japan. I'm really looking forward to going to Japan. Well, Andre, I hope you uh, take care and we'll catch up with you here at the uh, end of the episode for our roundtable. Now, still to come, we'll have another report from California, New Jersey, and today's entertainment news. This is Eagle News America. Stay with us. Events happen around us all the time, in our community, in our country, around the world. Events that affect people, move communities, or simply inspire us. Interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times. We continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events. Fast, accurate, balanced. Eagle News because we live in interesting times. Wildfire season is here, and the Golden State is not wasting any opportunity to come prepared. In fact, it comes with a $2 billion price tag. In Sacramento, Bureau Chief Angel Membrere files this report. Thank you. In California, preparation for the fire season continues as temperatures start to rise. Record droughts and record wildfires are no longer out of the ordinary which leads to more preparation and early efforts to prepare the state of California. 
Earlier this year, there was a $1 billion proposal which was set for forest management. At a recent press conference, Governor Gavin Newsom explains more about this budget. Let's listen. Today, we're announcing that $1 billion budget is now $2 billion. Uh, we are doubling our historic wildfire budget uh, from the $1 billion we proposed in January to now a $2 billion proposal that was submitted to the, um, to the legislature just last week. That $2 billion will allow us uh, to build on the $536 million of early action with an additional $708 million for our fuels management efforts in the state. Total here, i got to stay close to all this. We'll provide all the information. But it's a little over $1.2 billion, $1.24 billion to be exact, uh, just in our fire break fuels management forest health budget. In addition to that, uh, roughly $800 million more in our all-hazards emergency preparedness efforts in the state of California. Again, a $2 billion record-breaking investment in preparing for wildfire season and then looking medium and long-term at addressing the deficit in terms of our efforts on forest health, forest management, uh, fuels management, uh, as well as fire breaks all up and down the state of California. In addition, $80 million is set to secure nearly 1,400 new firefighters, which will be added to permanent crews. Aside from the preparations that the state is taking, Governor Newsom also reiterates what residents can do to prepare their homes for the wildfire season. Let's listen. With all of that, good enough never is. And all of us need to be mindful as we enter in the wildfire seasons, the importance of home hardening, the importance of defensible spaces, uh, if you have not cleaned out the front yard, your backyard, look at a defensible space, I want to remind everybody of the imperative to do just that. I want to remind everybody uh, that we also are providing tens of millions of dollars in grants for home hardening. And we look forward to working with the legislature to get that final appropriation through uh, and onto my desk over the course of the next few weeks. In Sacramento, California, Angel Manbury, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, 400 new posts are on the horizon as high-paying engineering jobs have been relocated to the state. In Union Township, Bureau Chief Carlo Valdez reports. Thanks, Philip. Governor Murphy visited the Lockheed Martin Morristown facility to highlight the expansion and addition of nearly 400 new jobs by 2023. Later on this year, Lockheed Martin will relocate their vertical launching systems production from Baltimore, Maryland to right here in our backyard, Morristown, New Jersey. Governor Murphy said Lockheed Martin is one of the giants in the defense contracting industry and New Jersey is proud to call them a valued partner. The relocation of these high paying engineering jobs to New Jersey is a testament to all that our state has to offer. And as for coronavirus stats and numbers, New Jersey reports of 423 new positive PCR tests, pushing the total to 886,271. Sadly, New Jersey is reporting 24 new confirmed deaths, pushing the total to 23,464 lives lost. In Union Township, New Jersey, Carlo Valdez, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Philip. It's time to head over to Julianne in Las Vegas for a look at movie options for this week. Julie. Thank you, Philip. Chaos Walking, already in theaters, is a uniquely interesting dystopian action film based on Patrick Ness's science fiction trilogy. With so many people posting every detail of their lives on social media these days, author Ness questions what if the next progression is you had no choice in what you put out for everyone to see? Imagine if your thoughts could be heard and seen by the people around you. Referred to as the noise in the movie, it's an affliction suffered by men on a planet colonized by humans in the not too distant future. Viola crash lands on this planet Stop, where the women have disappeared. Girl. 
It's a girl. Oh my gosh. Where are you She's from? discovered by Todd Hewitt, who, after his initial shock, instinctively sorry, sorry. sets out on a journey to protect Viola and unlock the planet's dark secrets. While the concept might seem simple enough, bringing the book to the big screen was no easy task. Writing the noise is a huge challenge because for something like that, you need to have a consistent rule. Like, when do we hear the noise? The idea is that it's kind of constantly happening, but then that would drown out any scene you could try to write. And sometimes that's the point. It's like people are just inundated with it. Such a unique concept that it almost breaks screenplay format. Like, you don't even know how to write it. We had to figure out a way to use it to tell the story and not just overwhelm every moment. My parents are dead. Special effects aside, creating relatable characters was also a strong focus. The phrase strong hair, strong female is used a lot in YA. And I worry that it gets in the way of them being, of, of her being fully human. You know, of course she's going to be strong, but there are moments where she's going to be weak, just like Todd. There's moments where she's going to be incredibly clever, but there's moments where she's going to make a, a stupid mistakes, just like Todd, just like human beings do. And so that's what I want. That's what I want. That's what I want my nieces to see. That's what I want, you know, young readers to see. I want to see a fully human, fully realized, complicated person because that's what a teenage years are about. It's interesting because we did the initial shoot and then we did some additional photography. The initial shoot was tricky in that I spent a lot of the time feeling confused as to what was going on. And Viola's confused, so it feels like it should work, but it was like trying to navigate how Viola and Todd work together. You know, it's a it's a tricky thing making relationships right when there are a hundred other things going on. So I, I always felt that Viola was a bit, not darker, but when I watched the film, I was surprised by the lightness with which Viola operates. And I think uh, the additional photography was actually really helpful because I think everyone had had a chance to figure out like, how the relationship was really gonna work. And then me and Tom knew each other a bit longer. So it was like easier for us to have more of like a repartee. But I'm afraid of her, right? Yeah. I think you're afraid of her that first second because you're like, whoa. And then that's gotta- And then just inquisitive. Inquisitive. So all of those things were actually really, really helpful to come back and tweak. And we had a couple new scenes. Watching. Actors bring so much more than you think they do. They're not just speaking words, they are adding. All, all their experience and all their choices um, and doing things that you would never think of and bringing your character to life. It's amazing. I mean, it's, novels are not collaborative and um, the collaborative experience of a movie when it's working well, when it's doing well, that's where you see the magic because it's them doing something that I couldn't do, um, reading maybe something that they couldn't do, but it's the best work of both people coming together and making something bigger and that's, that's great. I know guys, this is a great movie to catch in theaters, but the home entertainment pack being released today features nearly an hour of deleted scenes. So if you want to dive deeper into the story and experience, that might be your better option. For all you creatively gifted or inspired people out there, I have to say that Cruella is a must see. It's set around the story of how Cruella develops into the character we know from 101 Dalmatians. But more importantly, the show is a great lesson in creativity and storytelling, set designs, and my personal favorite favorite for the film, fashion design. Do you have a light? The sheer luck of a movie like this is that the costumes do a lot of your work for you as an actor. Once you put those things on, you feel like Cruella de Vil. Fashion is omnipresent in this film. So we got Academy Award winner Jenny Bevan. She's done it all. Cruella and the Baroness are adversaries in their work. The Baroness is at the height of fashion in the 1970s. How is Cruella going to disrupt the establishment? Fashion is Cruella's tool of revenge. This film is the biggest thing I've ever done. Emma Stone had 47 looks. It was very important to me for Corella to be black, white, grey and red. <laughs> I want to make art. And I want to make trouble. To first see the entire look of Corella together. 
I have to admit, I took a lot of pictures. It was a very narcissistic day. Which is perfect for Cruella. We'll just have to destroy her as we have so many before. Find her. The Baroness, I saw very clearly. It's very sculptural. Dior influenced. He sort of channeled the old screen divas, Joan Crawford, to Elizabeth Taylor. Every single costume I go, oh, this is my favorite. Oh, no, no, this is my favorite. Jenny has created something really special. <laughs> I'm starting to remember. You have a bit of an extreme side. Cruella comes out this Friday in theaters and on Disney Plus, so you can choose the option safest for your family. Also coming out Friday is A Quiet Place Part 2, which picks up right from where A Quiet Place Part 1 left off. It's a thriller that can only be seen on the big screen, and according to John Krasinski, the director, writer, and producer, that was no accident. Every step is much more treacherous. It definitely ratchets up the tension, and you know they're not safe. We made this movie for the theaters. You know, not only visually from the first one did we do a bunch of new things, and the world's bigger, and the tension's bigger, and all those things because they're no longer safe at home. But from a sound perspective, I mean, we knew how much people loved being in the audience, uh, being quiet, and then when it got loud and playing with sound all around. So we spent so much time making sure that this experience here was unlike any experience you can, you can watch this movie. And so for me, this is the only way to see this movie. I didn't know I could make a movie as personal as the first one. Ronnie, what do we got? Some kind of fire? We got units headed out there now. As psychotic as it sounds, the first movie was a love letter to my kids. And so the second movie to me had to be as organic and as powerful emotionally as the first one. And I think a lot of people think that sequels just become a sequel just because you can. And I certainly didn't want any part of that. I had one idea in my head, which was, um, what if you made Millie the lead of this movie? And this little girl is unbelievable in this movie. She carries the movie. And it really became this idea of if the first movie was about the promise we all make to our kids, which is I'll be there for you always. All parents know that that promise is going to be broken inevitably. And so the second movie is about when that promise is broken, which is what growing up really is. And so these kids learn to go out into the world on their own. And so I hope people take from it, hope, that idea of when you're scared, when things get um, uh, dark or, or sad, that you just put one foot in front of the other and you try to uh, do it all, all together. You can't do this on your own. You have to find people to do it with. A great takeaway that you don't normally find in a scary movie. Krasinski also invites us to take note of what watching movies means to the movie house industry. I know it means a lot to everybody in this whole theater family, all the people who work at these theaters across the country, and it's, it's really good. So come back and see our movie, but come back and see any movie. It's all very, very exciting. So whether you're looking into stepping into a new and unique story experience with Chaos Walking, or the bold and playful fashion extravaganza in Cruella, or even if you're set on watching a thrilling movie that puts you on the edge of your seat like A Quiet Place Part 2, this is definitely a good time to get back into the theaters. In Las Vegas, Julian Dosena, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Philip. Thanks, Julie. So I'm, I'm curious, you, you've given us a lot of options for this week and you kind of led into it there. When do you think you're going to make it back into theaters to watch a movie? You know, that is a very tough question to answer, actually, because there's a part, I am fully vaccinated and then there's a part of me, you know, when you're fully vaccinated, I'm not sure who can agree. It just gives you this new sense of confidence and peace that you can go out and you're safe. Um, but also throughout the pandemic, I got very used to my new comfort zone of being 
distant from people. And, um, you know, you really got a sense of how close people are in proximity to you. And so that part I'm still trying to let go of. Um, but also I love going to the movies. And so it is, it, I am torn a little bit. I'm still deciding on when I can go. Um, I know some theaters are implementing two seating, two section seating. And so if people want to stay distant, there's a section for them. And if people don't mind being close to others, there's a section for them as well. And so there are options for us who are not so sure. We do have a lot of options. So that way we can confidently decide for ourselves and our families. Um, but for me, yeah, I'm, these movies are super tempting to go see. So I, I might go back soon. What was the last movie that you watched in theaters? You know, I couldn't remember. So I actually had to look that up. I literally looked up all the the, the movies that came out um, in early 2020 and even the end of 2019. And the last movie I believe I watched was Birds of Prey, which was the Harley Quinn movie. Um, and that was quite entertaining. So I miss, I miss that experience. You know, and, and speaking about experiences, when it comes to actually going to the movie theater, what, what's your favorite part of that? Oh man, that's, you know, I love that question, especially being part of like the broadcasting industry. You know, I think we have a, a huge appreciation for the cinematography and all the things and the elements that go into productions. And so one of my favorite parts about going to the movies as opposed to just watching movies at home is being able to experience that movie and how it all came together with a whole crowd of people. Because, you know, for people who watch things that create huge fandoms like Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, things like that. When you see something happen in a movie, you're not just like, oh, that was so awesome. You're really cheering. And it's not just you, it's the whole theater. And so that's my favorite experience is not just being there and enjoying the movie, enjoying the sounds, enjoying like the different levels of audio and how great or clear a picture is, but also knowing that there's so many people enjoying this movie and appreciating the people who really were able to put it together to entertain all of us and to trans transport us from our seats into these different worlds. And so that's something that I really love. It's my favorite part of watching movies. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Julie, for sharing all of that with us. Uh, you know, on my part, I'd say it more simply, probably the popcorn, because uh, it's hard to replicate uh, movie theater popcorn when you're sitting at home. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us. And we'll, we'll catch up with you here um, at our roundtable here in just a few minutes. Up next, EBC Sports, Arts and Culture, and today's roundtable about National Brown Baggett Day. Eagle News America will return shortly. Stay with us. Na-excite ako dahil solid po yung line-up ngayon. Papatunayan ko na sa grupo man o solo performance, eh kaya kaya ko maipagsabayan. Papatunayan ko ngayon yun so na hindi dito magtatapos ang aking karera. Isa na namang umaatikabong bakbakan ang sasiyawan ang aming hatid sa inyo as we head unto our monthly finals. This is Tagi Sinanggaling Part 2 Dance Edition. The NBA playoffs have started and fans have not been disappointed. To give us some highlights of the first round games, EBC's EJ, EJ Gonzalez reports from Alexandria, Virginia. Okay. Thanks, Philip. Yep, the NBA playoffs officially tipped off this past weekend, and that means one thing for basketball fans. High intensity, meaningful games every single night. Now, here's a recap of last night's NBA action. The third seed Milwaukee Bucks hosted the sixth seed Miami Heat for game two of round one in the Eastern Conference. So last year, it was the Miami Heat who took out the Bucks in the playoffs and represented the Eastern Conference in the NBA Finals. Well, last night, the Heat looked to avoid an 0-2 hole from the Bucks. The first game was a nail biter, which went into overtime where Chris Middleton hit a game winner to edge out the Heat 109-107 allowing the Bucks to take a 1-0 lead in the series. The Bucks, although winning game one, had a horrible three-point shooting night, which is actually one of their greater strengths. That game, they went 5 of 31 from beyond the arc. 
Well, in game two, it was a completely different story. The Bucks had 10 three-pointers in just the first quarter and put up a total of 46 points in the first frame. Miami stars Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler, on the other hand, were struggling from the field and finished with a combined total of just 26 points for the entire game. The Bucks led wire to wire and cruised to a 132-98 to victory, taking a commanding 2-0 lead in the series. Now, in the Western Conference, the third seed Denver Nuggets hosted the six seed Portland Trail Blazers for game two of their series. The Blazers stunned the Nuggets in game one, and last night, the Nuggets looked to take momentum back. Denver looked to have total control of the game in the first half, but Damian Lillard did what he does best, hit timely, long-range three-point shots. Denver was up by as much as 18 points in the first half, but with Lillard's barrage of deep shots, he led Portland to close the second quarter on a 15 to five run and cut the lead to just four points. Well, in the second half, Nuggets made a defensive change and assigned Aaron Gordon on Damian Lillard. And that seemed to keep the Blazers star in check. The Nuggets took command again and tied up the series after a 128-109 victory in game two. Now there's a lot more NBA action tonight. Three games slated as the Nets went on to take a 2-0 lead against the Celtics. The Lakers now look to bounce back from their game one loss against the Suns, and the Clippers look to avoid going down 0-2 to the Mavericks. In Alexandria, Virginia, EJ Gonzalez, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Back to you, Philip. Thanks, EJ. And there's a lot of series uh, going on right now. Which uh, NBA playoff series are you enjoying the most? Well, there's definitely a lot of good matchups, uh, except probably for uh, Brooklyn and the Celtics. It looks like Brooklyn's going to run away with that. Might be a sweep, but for for the ones that I am enjoying, uh, I think it's got to be the Suns and Lakers series. Now, the Suns, a young, poised team looking to take out the defending champions who actually have a higher seed than them, <laughs> which is very surprising. So the, the Lakers come in as a lower seed, but... Uh, do come in as the favorites, but I think the Suns are uh, going to give them a, a good run. So that one uh, is uh, a series that I'm watching in the Western Conference. And of course, in the East, I got to watch my uh, Washington Wizards up against the Philadelphia 76ers. Of course, of course. Are there any upsets that you're <laughs> predicting? <laughs> one upset that I'm rooting for is, of course, the Wizards at, at that eight seed uh, against the, the number one team in the East and one of the best teams in the entire con in the entire league, the, the Philadelphia 76ers. It was a close one in game one. I'm hoping uh, that the Wizards can bounce back in game two. Now, EJ, I also know that the, EB, uh, the NBA just announced a few of the winners for the NBA awards. Uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts or commentary on that? Well, you know, you know uh, we actually in EB Sport, EBC Sports International, we made our predictions, and so far I'm three for three. Uh, Monty Williams wins uh, the coach of the coach of the year, and uh, our, our Filipino bread uh, <laughs> Jordan Clarkson wins sixth man of the year. So congrats to Jordan Clarkson, and um, and, and I think the, the latest news actually came today. Julius Randle wins the most improved. So so far three for three. I wonder if I'm gonna uh, get all those predictions right. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll just have to, to wait and see to, to find <laughs> yeah. out, EJ. Uh, now, now, before I, I let you go, um, I need to ask: Did you uh, did you bring any any lunch or snacks with you uh, for your report tonight? Uh, uh, no, no, <laughs> I did not. Well, 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 that's okay. Well, I guess that was I a fancy appetite. way to our uh, <laughs> virtual roundtable here. Because uh, May twenty fifth. <laughs> <laughs> May 25th is National Brown Baguette Day. Nas NationalDayCalendar.com mentions the, the benefits of this are it saves money when you bring your lunch. Uh, it improves health choices. It helps you control your portions. And if you're using resealable containers, it's better for the environment. So in the few moments that we have left, uh, we're going to ask our uh, fellow correspondents and EBC Team Tuesday a couple of questions. Uh, I know I put EJ there on the spot. Uh, Andre, uh, do you bring your lunch? And if so, why do you brown bag your lunch? So um, when I do have time, um, I do bring my own lunch, especially to work. Um, right now, I actually buy my lunch. It's prepackaged already. 
but it's set up in a way that helps meet my um, meet my goals because I also work out. Um, it has a preset um, amount of protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and it's a good amount, so it doesn't, um, you know, it keeps you full, and it's also really good on the budget. That sounds uh, pretty scientific, uh, Thomas. Uh, what do you, what do you put in your lunch bag? Oh, pretty much whatever I had last night for dinner will be my lunch today. Um, it's kind of the way I grew up. Uh, very, very old school, but uh, very economical. These days, though, because I'm uh, working at home, it's simply a matter of going upstairs to the kitchen. And my wife, because she works close to home, actually comes home for lunch now. But both of us were, were pretty much brown baggers. Maybe once a month, I, I, I might have... Uh, uh, gone for a little bit of fast food, but uh, but pretty much I've always brought my lunch to work. You know, and I you know I, I think about when when I was a kid and in bringing my lunch to school, uh, something that often would happen is uh, we we compare who had what and and do some trading. Uh, Julianne, uh, do you or did you ever uh, share your lunch, or do you have any stories about that? Um, when I was younger, actually, I really loved all the lunches that my mom packed for me. So I never traded, but I would let people have a little bit <laughs> if they wanted to taste it. And then if they ever wanted some more, I would ask my mom to make it again. But I had to have my own portion. So <laughs> never traded, but I shared. Sharing is caring. So I did share. <laughs> How about you, Philip? I can understand that. Um, and... Uh... Actually, no, I don't think I, I shared either. I was the same <laughs> way. Uh, although I, I don't know about, uh, or I didn't trade, and I maybe didn't share either, which is probably how I got to the physique that I have uh, today. Just be <laughs> a lot of things at lunch. I, I did want to ask you as a follow-up, though, Julianne, uh, what was the most requested uh, lunch item that your mom made? Oh, so my mom used to uh, make this. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is, but if there's a Filipino dish called adobo. And my mom would always make adobo fried rice the day after she made that and turn it into like a burrito. So it would literally be adobo fried rice with eggs and inside a tortilla. And I would bring that to school and eat that for lunch. And it's so good. It's the like, most simple thing to cook out of all the Filipino dishes to begin with. And then so doing that afterwards, really just make sure you don't waste any food. And it's so delicious, delicious the original way and in the burrito way. So I love that. And all my friends loved it too. So sometimes I'd ask for like six of these burritos. <laughs> and sometimes there wasn't enough because we ate all the adobo the day before. So, <laughs> And I know. think I know uh, when we have our uh, Eagle News uh, convention in Las Vegas, I know who's going to cater our uh, <laughs> cater <laughs> our meals now. Uh, EJ, I, I can't let you uh, let you off the hook. Uh, <laughs> where do you like to put your your lunch when you when you bring your brown brown bag? Now, I don't honestly don't even remember the last time I had to go to the office. So I, 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 all my memories uh, definitely were uh, when I was younger and in school. I was actually, you know, like I was actually a little bit more shy in sharing my food. Uh, I don't know. I was. I, I guess I was a little bit embarrassed because my food was just so uh, exotic compared to. Uh, you know, the the American regular lunch. So I I kind of like try to hide my <laughs> my food when I was eating. I was very uh, as a, as as I was a young boy, I was very I don't know embarrassed about it. But uh, I think now I don't I don't know why I was embarrassed. Filipinos have the best food. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I totally agree with that. Now, that's uh, unfortunately we, we we could go on talking about uh, Filipino food brought to lunch the next day uh, forever, but we have reached the end of our broadcast. But before we go, we want to make sure that we continue to salute all of our healthcare workers, first responders, frontliners, everybody helping us as we try to end this pandemic. Let's give everyone a round of applause. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate you. That's it for today's Eagle News America. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world. We hope that you're staying safe and you're staying well. And maybe also pack a lunch. This is Philip Toledo. We live in interesting times. Start up your weekday mornings with 